that we need to go. Yeah. You ready? Trace ship man to Did you come all the way from the Netherlands just to see this? Yeah. Mexico? Philadelphia. <laughs> This is great to get all these different bass players together from all different kind of areas of playing. Um, it's exciting to see everybody just kind of, you know, doing their thing. And it's exciting that we ha we're having these, you know, and I think we should have them every year and get the kids exposed to different cats, you know, this year. I'm sure there's some familiar names to them and also some things that maybe they haven't checked out. And, uh, I, I, I hope that we can keep getting this happening every year and getting all kinds of different things.
I wanted to know if you approach your solos different, having a bass playing behind you. We do. Uh, if you notice that m a lot of Michael's dexterity is, uh, is throughout the bass, but he plays a lot in the upper register of the bass uh, and uh, has become quite astute at that. Uh, um, but we both work uh, as journeymen, as players uh, in the rhythm section. so the bottom, but for soloing, uh, uh, I just try to think some melodies. you have some thoughts? I, I think it, um, probably for both of us, uh, it, there's a little bit of uh, give and take. And when we first started doing it, uh, we played a few nights in Zeno's, just the two of us. I think that as soon as you hear the other guy playing behind you, you naturally take to uh, other uh, other notes than you might not play because you don't have to fill out the bottom of the chord. You can leave more space. That's the real luxury of it is you have somebody doing the job there that uh, that uh, that you're doing for everybody else. So it's it's really luxury. And I mean, I leave a lot more space in my solos and maybe play uh, longer notes, uh, more like a horn player would or something. And it's it's really really fun. I recommend it to everybody. Yeah. People. We'll say, well, what do you mean? What do you mean, bass day? You know, uh, and I think it's about time. I mean, the bass players are the ones who can make or break a group, and sometimes they're the least people who get any compliments of any kind. Of course, you know, you've got uh, all these incredible uh, uh, bass guitarists on the scene that are doing some astounding things, uh, and uh, but the bass. And the, the fact that a lot of these students that we heard today, I mean, they, they, they don't hear the double bass that much. Uh, and it's not their fault, necessarily, but uh, I think it's great the fact that, uh, that this has come about because it's, I think, something that can grow. And uh, uh, the bass is a lot more important instrument than a lot of people may, at the outset, uh, want to give credit to it. Um, because it's the backbone of, of, of any of the ensembles and any, any kind of idiom you want to put it in. I can't tell you how honored I feel to be, you know, uh, on the same bill with guys who I just think the world of. You know, Tony Levin, uh, uh, Patitucci, everybody. I mean, all of these guys are monsters. And it was really a privilege for me to be asked to do it. And it's nice to be able to kind of represent Nashville and let everybody know that even though, you know, I really love country music. I'm interested in all kinds of things, and especially bass. And I think the Bass Collective is a great concept. Um, I'm a real believer in, in the power of numbers in that way, in terms of getting a bunch of brains on one project. It really uh, is important, I think, and, and I'm sure the people that are coming here, not just to this today, but coming to the school, are leaving with a, you know a really you know, pretty amazing amount of information. So, yeah, I think it's great. Count me in. You know, I, I, uh, I'm just glad to be here. Uh, in Nashville, most players that get into the session thing start out doing a lot of demos. You work with a lot of songwriters, a lot of publishing companies. And, um, you know, you kind of work your way up and you sort of come, you come together with people who are trying to get ahead and, you know, you lock into these great creative relationships. And every day is a different situation. In a demo session, normally runs three hours. We'll cut four to six songs with overdubs. So we move pretty quick. And uh, it can be real intense, but the good thing about it is is that in a demo situation, you don't have time to calculate and come up with, with things. You just have to pretty much shoot from the hip and just let your gut tell you what you ought to do. Um, the number chart is a great aid in that, in that as you can see, there's not a whole lot of stuff written out. And essentially, you're writing your own part as you go. And you create situations, uh, you know, amongst the other players. The steel player and the fiddle player will 
hook up and they'll real quick come up with a little arrangement. Uh, my job is to basically see what the drummer is going to do and make it sound like music. Let's imagine for a moment that uh, a struggling young country songwriter named Sting shows up at a demo session. Just signed him a publishing deal. And uh, he's got a song uh, that he's just written and uh, maybe the leader of the session has gone off in the back room and written a chart from a quick guitar vocal. But uh, I thought what I'd do is kind of take this number chart and show you some of the different changes and things we have to go through when we're doing this. It uh, can get pretty interesting. So let's suppose that Sting comes in and says, you know, uh, I'm still kind of looking for the right feel for this song, guys. I'm sure you can help me. Uh, kind of thinking it may be a bluegrass kind of thing. So let's, let's sort of start there. So if I don't have my acoustic bass in the studio, I'll probably play it on this thing. And uh, the intro would probably sound something like this. If it's real bluegrass, it'll probably be a little bit faster. <laughs> but this is bluegrass if we want to try to get on the radio. Every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, I'll be watching you. You get the idea. But then, oh, you know, he thinks, well, maybe that's not it, guys. Hey, let's, I think it needs to be a little more laid back. Let's try kind of a, oh, I don't know, maybe a Tex-Mex kind of feel. Every single day, every word you say, every game you play, Every night you stay. You get the idea. Okay, so he goes, well, oh, maybe uh, it's still not right, guys. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of making up my mind here. Maybe it's more of a bluesy thing. You know, it's kind of a downed lyric. Maybe we should do it as more of a blues. So here's, here's the bridge. Maybe if we change the key, maybe go to the key of E. Uh, oh, can't you see? You belong to me. How my poor heart aches With every step you take Supposing uh, he wants to do it as what we, what we a lot of times call a Ray Price shuffle, which is a 4-4 four, four thing where the piano and the bass will do this arpeggio thing together. It's, it's a different kind of shuffle than a straight blues. Okay, so we're in the key of C and we go down. Since you're gone, I've been lost without a trace. I dream at night and I only see your face. Look around, but it's you I can't replace. Feel so cold and I long for your embrace. Keep crying, baby, baby, please. You get the idea. And you know, it's really, it's not my choice to make. You know, if somebody says, hey, which of these fields do you think would work? I might say, well, you know, Sting, I think it would probably be kind of an eighth note rock thing. It would probably, it would probably work pretty well. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that's what you get into sometimes with these guys. Uh, you just kind of have to see, uh, see what they want to do and, and follow. It's real important to be flexible. It's real important to not have any musical prejudices because they're just going to get you in trouble. You know, look at your whole persona and not just what you're doing with the bass. It's great to have the chops. It's great to have hot licks under your belt. But ultimately, they're hiring you for a lot of other qualities besides how fast you can play. You know, it's really about, are you feeling that song? It's about your heart, giving your entire being to them for that moment on their song. Because these people are spending their own money or their, you know, their career's on the line. You've got to give them what they need. Uh, I really appreciate your chance to be here. I'm going to leave you with a song that uh, is something I wrote with a fellow named Russell Smith in Nashville. This is another song from my record. And... Um, it's kind of about that feeling of not giving up. The song's called Working Against Resistance. It's hard to believe all the trouble we see today. It makes you feel like crying. What's the use in trying anyway? Oh, but you've got to hold on. You just can't let go. You think your strength is gone, but you know that working against resistance makes you stronger. 
Working against resistance makes you grow. Working against resistance, you last much longer. I do it all the time, that's how I know. You want to get real, got to get real. Trying to be real and know just how you feel. Working against resistance makes you stronger. Working against resistance makes you grow. Resistance makes you grow. Working against resistance, you last much longer. I do it all the time, that's how I know. Working against resistance makes you stronger. Working against resistance makes you grow. I said, oh, working against resistance, you last much longer. I do it all the time, that's a how I know. That's a how I know. That's a how I know. Makes you stronger. I said it makes you stronger. Instead of working against resistance, it makes you strong, strong, strong. Appreciate it very much. Enjoy the day. It's going to be a great one. I'm still so intimidated by my heroes, and or not intimidated, but just so in awe of them. I have them up on a pedestal, and it, you know, like right now, I'm sitting there going, "Okay, I hope Rufus ain't leaving, and I hope Tony Levin's still walking around, you know, because I really want to rap with these guys." And uh, it's just incredible. Uh, it's overwhelming. It's like a dream come true for me to just be on the same stage with these guys. I hope they do some more of this. This could be like a three-day thing, you know, with lots of cats. So, but I think that I was glad to see the variety that they had. Thank you. 
Kind of developed this stuff by accident, with you know, in the momentum of the moment, and I've discovered after some students <laughs> telling me what I was doing because I guess I wasn't explaining it very well, that I do a lot of tapping with uh, this finger on my left hand, um, and then uh, there's some stuff like the triplet stuff uh, where you you lead you lead off with the tap. Yeah, just two, yeah. I ain't like Percy. I can't get them three going, man. I would need to get him to show me that. But, uh, 
and a lot of uh, a lot of the. It's a lot of tapping. So I'm I'm cheating really. I mean, I guess there is no cheating really, but I, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Obviously, Jocko was a huge influence as far as chords and stuff like, but everything. But uh, I really uh, I I took a lot of the the basic chords that you use on a four string, like a a dominant seventh, and when I got the five string. That's yeah, just one, seven, ten. I added a fifth on top. So I had like a thirteen. And, uh, you know, obviously when I got the sixth string, I just keep adding a fourth on top of everything, you know. So you got, you know, that's that same chord with a fourth on top of that. How about, let's slow it down a little bit. Thank you very much. As we speak, there are clinics going on. The one I heard of, Dave Pomeroy, I learned a lot of stuff, so it was interesting. 
I, I even like if I have time taking bass lessons. So I, I'm a, like most guys. I, mean, I have a lot to learn. And this is a very interesting atmosphere to pick up stuff from other guys. I'm not going to get to hear all the clinics. I think I'd be overwhelmed with a whole day of learning about the bass. But of course, it's a nice resource and interesting for bass players. Everyone in this room can play faster than I can on the bass. It's not that I'm that slow. It's that I'm not a very fast player. And, and very fast playing is very popular now, and, and it's cool. And what I'm about is, is more choosing the right notes that I want to play. So as I've torn down my playing, and I thought, what is it I try to do when I make up a bass part for an album for Peter Gabriel or for even King Crimson, where there's a lot of notes flying by, even for me? Uh, and the answer is that I try to play... I, I love the good note, the, good, the one good bass note, if I'm playing it or someone else is playing it, the one note that seems right, that's at the right time, with the right sound and the right feel, and of course, what I, this is to me, what I feel is the right note, be different to someone else, some other listener. So I'm, there I am trying for that one right note, or more of them. You put a lot of them together, you get one really good bass line. And, and I, I can't overemphasize what, to me, is the huge effect of one right note on the bass, one good note. As I think about it, I think it frees all of the other guys in the band to make better music. It frees the drummer to not have to keep the time so much for you. He still will keep the time, but he can, he can put more of his personality into it and not worry about holding you down if you're the bass player. I do a couple albums a year projects with people, and I love doing that. And, and I thought I should mention what I bring. This was covered again in Dave's talk. What I bring to a session with someone. I, I, I might bring one bass, or I might bring a bunch of basses. But the essence of what I bring, I think, is uh, I really love music, and I love the, the chance that I'll get the opportunity to make some really good music or to be part of it. The bass part, to me, doesn't have to be the main thing. If it's a good singer, I'm going to really be focused on what they're singing. If it's about lyrics, I'm going to be listening to the lyrics. That doesn't really influence the notes I pick, but that's what I'm about. If it's instrumental and we're all there to play, have a good time, I'm going to have a good time and get wild. But uh, if, if, if it's about the lyrics, I'm listening to the lyrics. If it's about a songwriting thing, then I'm listening to the songwriting, and I will strive in my kind of unconscious way to come up with a bass part that complements best that song. I always played bass way back, like in Genesis, I, uh, not the band, in the, the Bible, I was playing bass. <laughs> I... <laughs> I chose it when I was very, my parents, I played piano, and they said, what instrument do you want to play? And, and I said, definitely the bass. And they said, why? And I didn't know why. I still don't know why. And it's an interesting thing that, that much later I realized that it was really a good decision for me. It was obviously not from my brain, and it wasn't, obviously it wasn't to be uh, a, a rock star. There was no rock in those days, and there were no rock stars. And, and it was a good decision. It's still, I'm still the same. I still want to play the bass. I still don't know why. I don't want to take a solo. I don't want to be the guitar player. I go to a session or I'm in a band, any situation. I'm given a bass part sometimes. Sometimes I'm not given anything. And I thought maybe it's interesting how many of those notes do I play. So this first piece I'm going to play with, I was given the entire bass line. It was written by Bill, Bill Bruford. The piece was, Bill is the drummer, wonderful drummer in King Crimson. I think he, he actually got the part from uh, tapes he made at a sound check we played of a, of a thanks of a bass line that I played.
people, you know, we launched this program and it's been going real well. And, you know, because we're, our emphasis is trying to make really broad and, you know, strong musicians out of bass players, not just uh, cats that sort of do one thing. But at least expose them, and cause them to listen to the history of each style and how it came to be so that they don't just uh, have a, just a perspective of, you know, the last five years. But instead, you know, the last 20, 30 years, hopefully. And on the acoustic bass, the last 100 years, you know, going all the way back to the, the virtuosos from Europe like uh, Dragonetti and Bottasini and all those guys. You know, so, I mean, you know, we're just trying to expose people to music and, and get them interested. We, we have them taking some piano so that they can learn some voicings and inspire them to get their harmonic things together. And I'm enjoying it.
this philosophy. I think that obviously, like everybody said before me, playing the bass is the most important thing, playing the right part for the right thing. But when it comes to soloing in a jazz context, I want to sound like a tenor saxophone player. Forget guitar players. I want to sound like a tenor saxophone player. So that's who I listen to a lot. And when I, pl when I blow, when I'm not doing my bass chore, you know, my thing, which I love, it's not a chore, it's a, just part of what I do. But I want to sound like train. I want to sound like, I mean, not that I can, but it's something to shoot for, isn't it? You know, you've got to set your sights high. So um, I try to think and get phrases and be lyrical and melodic like tenor saxophone players. So that tune was like a D, it's basically a D minor blues with, with the turnaround being a little different. But see, Chick would get it going up there pretty quick, right? So basically my whole thing was to try to stay relaxed enough to make some music and not just sound like I was playing a bunch of scales in my solo because I wanted to keep that thing. I w uh, a lot of times what I would think of in that, mo in, in that tune would, what would Joe Henderson play on this was sort of my thing. Like, wow, I could hear Joe playing on that and thinking, wow, if I could just get that sort of feeling and create that vibe, then maybe... Maybe the people would get something different, you know, instead of just playing it safe. So I was a little kamikaze about it. Thank <laughs> you. 
What an amazing day. Uh, I, I wish if, when I was 16 or 17 I could have seen something like this. Uh, it was just amazing. Uh, what an honor to be up with such great players, uh, Tony and uh, Othiel, uh, uh, John, of course, uh, the two gentlemen, the two stand-up players who I apologize I, I wasn't aware of until I saw them play tonight. Unbelievable. I mean, just, just mind-blowing. Uh, just, just what a joy to play. Uh, 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 around people like that, and uh, it was a great honor to be on the same stage. And like I said, I wish I was—I wish I could have been in the audience in 16 again. Oh, I'd be a lot better player today if I would have seen that when I was 16. <laughs>
uh, up, up high is where, you know, it's, it's, so when I'm practicing and I have the bass here, so when I stand up, it's still in the same spot. So uh, uh, as I was playing and bending the neck by pushing, the leather incrementally was uh, stretching. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Until pretty soon I was wondering why I couldn't play any of that. By the encore, I was, I couldn't. And plus the, um, since the strap has to be very strong to hold up against that, I'd have to bolt the strap onto the bass, and it would stay on the bass after the bass came off me, soaking wet with sweat, into the case, on the truck to the next gig. Come out, soaking wet, into the case, truck, next gig. Ad infinitum there. And uh, I wonder after the show why no one would talk to me. <laughs> Because the strap stunk so bad and the funk fermented on there so badly. So I, I, always, bolt, I always bolt the, uh, the strap on permanently. So when I do bend it, I just get behind it and bend that. I use the D tuner, I get it, get it down to the C. I mostly use three fingers. But sometimes a four-finger thing for like a, this one thing. It's a raking technique. I learned uh, when I first heard Tim Bogart in the Vanilla Fudge, I at that point decided I've got to play with my fingers forever because he was, I loved his playing when I first heard him in, uh, in, uh, uh, back in, way back in the late 60s. And uh, he did a thing at the time. I didn't know what it was called, but he calls it raking where the fingers just kind of rake like a... And they, they hit a couple different things. So basically the raking, it goes uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, one... And you can kind of do a, a lot of notes without a lot of effort. And then we started to do the, which we call the Woody Woodpecker lick. Me and uh, Steve Vai, we were working. Like, ha, 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 ha. Started doing that. In. Not a lot of movement, actually. So, uh, so it's not really of a lot of use, only that specialty kind of thing like that, but occasionally I'll, I'll use it for. He asked me if I still split my signal between high and low. Just doing a clinic generally or playing just for demonstration purposes, I just use this one output, as you notice the bass has two, uh, and that's this pickup. Uh, years and years and years ago, I had a uh, Fender Super Bassman amp, and I lent it to a guy, I had a Fender bass, and I lent my amp to a guy that had a Gibson EBO or EB3, it had the big giant pickup here, and it had all this super deep low end on it, and I really liked it a lot. Uh, but I couldn't get that sound out of the Fender, but I still love the Fender bass, so I wrote to Gibson, they sent me a Gibson pickup, and I, again, chiseled it out of my living room floor. My mom had to vacuum up the wood chips uh, out of the carpet, you know, and I, and I, I plugged it in there. I didn't know how to wire a switch, so I just put the volume tone and put another output and ran two chords into two different channels. What that enabled me to do was to get all the articulation and all the, all the, all the high stuff out of that one. And watch it, uh, Sal Man. This is going to make a little thing here. Thank you, your secretary. Okay. And, uh, and this one does the... All the real low... Uh, uh, Glenn Cornick from Jethro Tull had that sound. All oh, the super deep low end. So uh, originally through two channels, then as I played more and earned, earned more money to buy more equipment, I got two amps, and I had a low amp and a high amp. And it really helped out with basically the woofer tweeter principle where uh, the low frequency won't reproduce the high, and vice versa. And when they both try to do it, they both compromise each other. So one amp doing just a super deep low end, and another amp doing the, the highs. It helped a lot in, in uh, actually in developing, uh, I guess what you'd call uh, some, some form of a style because uh, we, I was in a three-piece band for years and years and years. And, and uh, if we'd make 100 bucks, it'd be 33 bucks a piece. If we had to hire a keyboard player, another guitar player, it'd be only 25 bucks a piece. So I started to learn the extra parts that we needed to do in order to eliminate having to get that extra guy. So we'd play... Uh, We'd play Schizoid Man by uh, King Crimson, and, and, and uh, I, I do the extra little parts just to try and later. And the chords generally will, will, will knock that whole sound out, but with a low end underneath there. I, I should have hooked it up to show you. I swear to God it works. 
no matter what kind of player you are, no matter what you're doing uh, in music or whatever, I just want to wish you the absolute ripping, vicious, incredible best of luck to get the dream that you want to get. And I think you can do it. Uh, if some, some bonehead from Podunk, Buffalo, New York can get there, <laughs> I, I'm sure you can do as well or better. And I just want to wish you the absolute best for that. And thank, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible honor to be up here in front of the uh, gentlemen that came before me, all of them on bass. Just an amazing evening. Thank you very much for letting me be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Washington, O'Teal Burbridge, <laughs> Billy Sheehan, Dave Pomeroy, and Lionel Cordu on the drums. Yes, he doesn't play bass, but he doesn't have to play drums like that. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. God bless you, and drive safe. In this segment, I would like to show you three separate tricky little bits that work really good to impress people. That would be harmonics, tapping, and double stops.
Tapping is kind of a fun thing. It's been made quite popular by Billy Sheehan, who is awfully good at it. It's simply holding down one note, using your pinky, letting it go, using your index finger, letting it go, bringing your pinky back, and just repeating. Here's a variation I'm going to do, just moving my right hand up and down the neck. One, two, three, four. Another technique is harmonics. Now, some of you have used harmonics to tune, but you can also use them as chords. Now, if I were to hit an E and take the G and the D position, you hear it's a lovely E minor chord. There's also another one here, and there's another one here. Now, these harmonics can be done all over the neck. Now I'd like to show you something called double stops. Double stops simply means you play two notes at the same time. Simple thing. Now if you're able to play a scale on one string, and it would look like this. We're starting on an E. Two, three, four, five, six. Dominant seven, because we're playing rock and roll. And then to eight. Now if you harmonized that, if you took the third above that, and then you took the third above this, and kept going, you'd have the whole thing harmonized as you get to the top. This position is the same as that, and you simply start over again if you're that ambitious to try it. Here's a little example of how it would work. Three, Four. In this example, I'd like to do two different things. I'd like to do a power slide. I, I call it a power slide because it's a one and a five, which is a power chord which slides from the dominant seven to the major. Then we go down and use a third in the bass. So you have one, two, three, and your octave on top. Now that's just another way of playing an A chord. You could play an A chord, the one, the five, and the eight. In this example, though, I'm using the three of the chord and it will sound like that. Let's play it with the band and see what it sounds like. One, two, three, four. <laughs> In this segment, I would like to show you three separate tricky little bits that work really good to impress people. That would be harmonics, tapping, and double stops.
Tapping is kind of a fun thing. It's been made quite popular by Billy Sheehan, who is awfully good at it. It's simply holding down one note, using your pinky, letting it go, using your index finger, letting it go, bringing your pinky back, and just repeating. Here's a variation I'm going to do, just moving my right hand up and down the neck. One, two, three, four. Another technique is harmonics. Now, some of you have used harmonics to tune, but you can also use them as chords. Now, if I were to hit an E and take the G and the D position, you hear it's a lovely E minor chord. There's also another one here, and there's another one here. Now, these harmonics can be done all over the neck. Now I'd like to show you something called double stops. Double stops simply means you play two notes at the same time. Simple thing. Now if you're able to play a scale on one string, and it would look like this. We're starting on an E. Two, three, four, five, six, dominant seven because we're playing rock and roll, and then to eight. Now if you harmonized that, if you took the third above that, and then you took the third above this, and kept going, you'd have the whole thing harmonized as you get to the top. This position is the same as that, and you simply start over again if you're that ambitious to try it. Here's a little example of how it would work. Three, Four. In this example, I'd like to do two different things. I'd like to do a power slide. I, I call it a power slide because it's a one and a five, which is a power chord, which slides from the dominant seven to the major. Then we go down and use a third in the bass. So you have one, two, three, and your octave on top. Now that's just another way of playing an A chord. You could play an A chord. In this segment, I would like to show you three separate tricky little bits that work really good to impress people. That would be harmonics, tapping, and double stops. Tapping is kind of a fun thing. It's been made quite popular by Billy Sheehan, who is awfully good at it. It's simply holding down one note, using your pinky, letting it go, using your index finger, letting it go, bringing your pinky back, and just repeating. Here's a variation I'm going to do, just moving my right hand up and down the neck.
Another technique is harmonics. Now, some of you have used harmonics to tune, but you can also use them as chords. Now, if I were to hit an E and take the G and the D position, you hear it's a lovely E minor chord. There's also another one here, and there's another one here. Now, these harmonics can be done all over the neck. Now I'd like to show you something called double stops. Double stops simply means you play two notes at the same time. Simple thing. Now if you're able to play a scale on one string, and it would look like this. We're starting on an E. Two, three, four, five, six, dominant seven because we're playing rock and roll, and then to eight. Now if you harmonized that, if you took the third above that, and then you took the third above this, and kept going, you'd have the whole thing harmonized as you get to the top. This position is the same as that, and you simply start over again if you're that ambitious to try it. Here's a little example of how it would work. Three, Four. In this example, I'd like to do two different things. I'd like to do a power slide. I, I call it a power slide because it's a one and a five, which is a power chord, which slides from the dominant seven to the major. Then we go down and use a third in the bass. So you have one, two, three, and your octave on top. Now that's just another way of playing an A chord. You could play an A chord the one, the five, and the eight. In this example, though, I'm using the three of the chord, and it will sound like that. Let's play it with the band and see what it sounds like. One, two, three, four. <laughs> In this segment, I would like to show you three separate tricky little bits that work really good to impress people. That would be harmonics, tapping, and double stops. Tapping is kind of a fun thing. It's been made quite popular by Billy Sheehan, 
who is awfully good at it. It's simply holding down one note, using your pinky, letting it go, using your index finger, letting it go, bringing your pinky back, and just repeating. Here's a variation I'm going to do, just moving my right hand up and down the neck. One, two, three, four. Another technique is harmonics. Now, some of you have used harmonics to tune, but you can also use them as chords. Now, if I were to hit an E and take the G and the D position, you hear it's a lovely E minor chord. There's also another one here, and there's another one here. Now, these harmonics can be done all over the neck. Now I'd like to show you something called double stops. Double stops simply means you play two notes at the same time. Simple thing. Now if you're able to play a scale on one string, and it would look like this. We're starting on an E. Two, three, four, five, six, dominant seven because we're playing rock and roll, and then to eight. Now if you harmonized that, if you took the third above that, and then you took the third above this, and kept going, you'd have the whole thing harmonized as you get to the top. This position is the same as that, and you simply start over again if you're that ambitious to try it. Here's a little example of how it would work. Three, Four. In this example, I'd like to do two different things. I'd like to do a power slide. I, I call it a power slide because it's a one and a five, which is a power chord, which slides from the dominant seven to the major. Then we go down and use a third in the bass. So you have one, two, three, and your octave on top. Now that's just another way of playing an A chord. You could play an A chord the one, the five, and the eight. In this example, though, I'm using the three of the chord, and it will sound like that. Let's play it with the band and see what it sounds like. One, two, three, four. <laughs> 